All right. Thank you so much, Lee. Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar, Academic Advising for Military Students. I would like to start off by thanking our sponsor, the Nakata Interest Group, advising veterans, military students, and their family members. As Lee mentioned, in February of 2014, myself and three other advisors were asked to give Nakata's first veteran-specific webinar. We had so many additional questions and follow-up from our first webinar that Nakata felt like an additional webinar was definitely in order. In the previous webinar, for those of you who weren't able to be with us, we looked at who our student veterans are, the deployment cycles, the challenges and strengths that they bring to our campus, and as well as admissions and prior learning and even online learning from a distance. Today, we are very excited to continue these discussions as our panelists dive a little bit deeper into each one of these topics. Um, you can see them on our slide over here, but I'm going to go ahead and read them off as well. Um, the things we're going to talk about today are what it means to be military-friendly and a military-friendly institution, looking at the complexities of navigating military life, and even more so the benefits and how that all works with the VA. Identifying struggling students, green zone training, which may be new for most of you guys, have maybe haven't heard of something like this, academic self-management, and our military students. As each of our presenters start, I'll give you a little bit of background of who they are and why student veterans are important in their role on their campus. And so first off, we're going to have Amy Jeffs and Robin Lawther from Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University online campus. Say that three times fast. Amy serves as Director of Undergraduate Advising with Embry-Riddle, the Department of Online Education, and Robin serves as the Director for Graduate Advising. Both Amy and Robin have been working with veteran students since they started with the university. Through their advisement training and roles with online education, they are dedicated to our current active military and our veterans while ensuring they are getting the best experience possible and making the most out of their academic funding um, so that they are getting everything they need towards that military education benefit. Embry-Riddle serves a large military population. It comprises of almost 60% of their student body and has been named one of the top military-friendly institutions by several different organizations, um, GI Jobs, Military Advanced Education Magazine, and Military Times, just to name a few. Here is Robin to get us started. Thank you, Jill, for the warm introduction. I'm honored to be involved with this webinar, and I'm excited to speak to you all about Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. Embry-Riddle Worldwide has worked with service members since 1970. We take pride in our relationship with our military and veteran students, and we understand the challenges in balancing academics with military duties and family obligations. We offer award-winning programs that are military-focused and friendly. At the online campus, we also understand the challenges of attending courses virtually, and that will be the main focus of our presentation today. We're committed to assisting our students in every way possible as their success is our highest priority. As Jill mentioned, we have several awards that are veteran and military service specific. For instance, in 2014, we were named one of the best schools for active duty military and veterans for the fifth straight year in Military Advanced Education Magazine. ERU Worldwide was also ranked number two in the nation for best online bachelor degree programs for veterans. And our Daytona Beach campus was ranked number one for veterans among regional universities in the South. So as a whole, our university is quite dedicated. And specifically with the worldwide campus, six out of our nine current VA counselors are veterans representing three branches of the military. Our registrar's office evaluators are branch specific to aid in awarding and understanding transfer credit. We also follow the VA principles of excellence and participate in the yellow with ribbon program. And for those of you who are not familiar with Embry-Riddle, we have over 150 satellite campuses all over the uh, U.S. as well as in Europe that are located on military installations. So you might be asking yourself, 
What does it mean to be military friendly? At Embry-Riddle, this means a commitment to serving and supporting our military and veterans and their families in every way possible. We continue to review and improve our services and strive to provide degrees of the highest academic quality. We have, as I mentioned, dedicated military and VA student services. We have transfer credit policies that are very generous when it comes to awarding military service and training as for credit. We also offer multiple scholarship opportunities for active duty military students to help offset the out-of-pocket costs for tuition. In addition, we offer a reduced tuition rate for all uniformed members of the U.S. Armed Forces. In addition to reduced tuition rate, we also have application fee waivers, which are available in some instances. Application fees can be waived for active U.S. military members who apply while serving within a combat zone. Those who apply 12 months of returning from a tour of duty in a combat zone. And we are proud to offer waivers to individuals who are recipients of various distinguished service honors. In addition, we have specific drop and withdrawal policies for military members with unanticipated official military travel or deployment. Specifically, we follow the HEOA policy. If you're not familiar with this, it's also known as the Higher Education Opportunity Act. This policy allows us more flexibility when we work with our uniformed service members who are returning to the university after a break in their studies or who need to drop or withdraw from a course due to military reasons. If the student is returning to the university, they are also not required to submit the application fee. When permitted within the guidelines outlined in this policy, we can approve drops or withdrawals outside of our normal windows of opportunity for these requests as long as students are able to supply the appropriate military documentation within 30 days of receiving their notification of deployment or start of service that's related to travel, which might prevent continued enrollment in our courses. And last but not least, we also offer shorter semesters at our university that are nine weeks in length, and this helps our military students pursue their education with their ever-changing schedules. Our advising structure is comprised of 24 dedicated advisors. We have 16 undergraduate advisors and eight graduate academic advisors who are all very familiar with military and veteran policies and procedures. With all of our worldwide campuses combined, the university serves just under 18,000 students. The largest military student population with us is the Air Force, and that's at about 4,500 students, which is approximately 25% of our total population. We're almost exactly 50% civilian and 50% military. However, it is important to note that the civilian rate also includes veterans, so when it comes to being military, either active or veteran, we are over 50%. I thank you all for your time, and now I'm going to hand it over to Amy, who's going to share some important information on our degree map process and other services we provide to our military students. Thank you, Robin. I appreciate that, and it's great to be with all of you today. As Robin mentioned, at Ember-Riddle Online, we are always looking for ways to remain connected with our students and assist them with persisting through their degrees. Our ultimate goal, like many of you and like many other institutions, is to provide top-notch education along with exceptional uh, academic advising to ensure that our students have the resources they need to continue throughout their degree programs and ultimately graduate, which is what they really want to do. Within our department, we work with students primarily through virtual means and communicate over the phone and via email. This can be sometimes challenging and lead to a disconnect between the advisor and the student, as well as a sense of lingering detachment between the student and the university. These factors can sometimes result in lower than expected new student matriculation and retention rates, as well as attrition. Over the last year and a half or so, our department has seen a significant improvement in all of these uh, areas through the use of degree maps. And degree maps are the first service I would like to share with you today. A degree map is a unique and personalized document that is developed for each student after they are admitted to the university. On the screen, you will see here an example of an undergraduate degree map. For undergraduate students, it prescribes the first year recommended coursework, 
We have found this extremely useful for course planning and to ensure undergraduate students are completing prerequisite and general education courses early and help to avoid obstacles later. I don't know about all of you, but in our experience, our undergraduate students, especially our adult learners, unfortunately like to save all of those classes towards the bitter end and that can uh, sometimes lead to obstacles later. So having a degree map really helps us to avoid that. Also, breaking this down uh, by year for an undergraduate student has also been very helpful in celebrating milestones with our undergraduate students. It is often much easier for an undergraduate to plan chunks of the degree out at a time versus looking at the entire picture and losing focus and maybe getting overwhelmed by the full 120 hours needed. As you can see, a degree map outlines what courses the student should take and in what term to take them. This is also a great conversational piece and tool that both students and advisors use each term so that we all have a very clear understanding about what courses to take and when. For the undergraduate student, this one-year map can also be used for any students admitted conditionally and that have to maybe meet certain criteria to remain in status with the university. They are updated also throughout the entire uh, program for the student and will ultimately become a graduation map, which can be a very power powerful tool for our students. On this slide, you can see an example of a graduate student degree map. For graduate students, the degree map is created for the entire program and can be updated and revised throughout the student's tenure with the university. One of the advantages with the graduate level degree map is that students can see from start to finish what their progression might look like and have, can have a clear timeline to graduation. We have found uh, for graduate students this helps keep their motivation on track and again really keeps the line of communication open and clear about what is needed to meet all program requirements. And again I just feel this is a, just a, such a powerful tool to show students ultimately when they can graduate. Specifically for our military and veteran students, degree maps have been a huge help in course planning and maximizing their tuition benefits by avoiding duplication of courses. Staying on track with their program, especially if the military promotion is in the works and dependent on degree completion, and also helps students um, obtain tuition assistance. In other words, the Air Force portal is a good example of the uh, new requirements that some students have to meet. The degree map also assists our military students in registering early. As the Department of uh, Defense and some military branches have put stricter timelines on students to request and obtain TA um, earlier, a student's degree map can plan out the entire year in advance and the student can request TA as soon as possible rather than waiting until the last minute. The benefits of degree maps are many and our students are not only enjoy seeing their program laid out in a simple format and structured like they're used to, but it keeps everyone organized and on track. A few other services that we would like to share with you today that we provide for our students really deal a lot with uh, being personalized and proactive in our communication to our students. For example, uh, each term, in addition to degree maps, each advisor proactively contacts all of their students that have not yet registered but should be to see how we can assist each month. This is especially helpful for undergraduate students because we have 12 terms um, each year uh, at the undergraduate level. So ultimately, an undergraduate student could be enrolled in a term that starts every month. This can be sometimes a little bit confusing for our students in keeping track of knowing when to start each term or when payment might be due. And our proactive communication to them really helps that and keeps them on track with when they need to register next. We also proactively reach out to inactive students, those who have maybe stopped out, who we maybe haven't heard from in a while, so that we understand and um, know what's going on so we can best assist them. This is especially important for our military students because we often don't find out until it's too late or until a crisis comes up about what might be going on in their lives or maybe they were deployed and we don't know how we could have helped them earlier. By reaching out proactively, we can stay on top of all of those issues and make sure that we're doing all we can to plan accordingly. The advising teams at our campus also assist students with all academic status issues, late drop or withdrawal requests when unexpected military travel or deployment arises. We serve as the liaison for students with course instructor issues, assist with all first level questions issues with using tuition assistance, VA benefits, financial aid, and academic credit evaluation issues, and, and anything else you could really think of. Really, our hope is to become that that one point of contact for our students and especially those that might be deployed so they don't have to worry about contacting one person to help them with all of their needs. 
At the Worldwide Campus in Embry-Riddle, we also offer asynchronous and synchronous course modalities and several term offerings, like I mentioned before. Students at the Worldwide Campus also have the ability to take on-ground courses, online courses, Eagle Vision Home courses, and Eagle Vision Home really serves to emulate an in-classroom experience and via, uh, excuse me, in real time via web video conference or a blend of modes. We try to offer as much flexibility as possible so that students continue their studies when travel or deployment arises. We also offer online, real-time tutoring and all undergraduate and select graduate math courses available, which is free to all of our students. As they enroll in those math courses, the tutoring becomes available to them and they can use that throughout the entire term. Our advisors are also knowledgeable in all areas and serve, again, as the main point of contact for anything that a student needs and stay current with all TA changes and VA benefit updates. And these are just a few of the great services that we provide to our students. Oftentimes, when helping a student with planning or if we have spoken to an inactive student, we often learn that there are students who have difficulty with the challenges that military life can bring. Another service that an academic advisor gives to their military and veteran students is to helping uh, them navigate through these complexities of military life. Often this discussion can come up with our students when talking about academic struggles. Because our students don't come into the office and we don't have the luxury of seeing them face to face, we'll have to pick up on certain cues via email and phone that they are struggling and uh, offer ways that we can help them with that. Many times active duty students deploy and travel throughout their studies while they're taking classes actively. This can sometimes lead uh, to a large gap between courses and thus a gap in their knowledge of using our systems and information and could lead to the student breaking status, which is something that we ultimately try to avoid. This is really why proactive communication is so important and, and that we want to try to eliminate this as much as possible. In some instances, if a student were to have a large gap in their status and ultimately break status and then have to reapply later, they might lose a lot of that credit they awarded previously just from coming from one catalog to another catalog year. So we want to avoid that. Some of our veteran students have voiced that they have also difficulty managing getting back into civilian life in addition to using the online format. There are a lot of technical challenges they might face. We have things such as an ORNT01 class, which is an orientation to online learning that we offer our students. And we also get the students, of course, in touch with their advisor to help them with any of those scheduling or other technical challenges they might have so we can get them to the appropriate party for assistance. Family also plays a part uh, in some of the challenges that our military and veteran students face as they struggle to juggle those responsibilities along with the demand of online coursework. There's often a um, misconception with online coursework that it's going to be a lot easier than maybe even attending a face-to-face -face class. In reality, they find it much more difficult because they're coming from such a structured environment and now into a civilian life where they're back in the swing of things with family and a civilian job that they're finding it difficult to figure out how to balance that and, and schedule themselves to get their work done. We offer a few resources and uh, can put the students in touch with uh, people that can help them with that. And ultimately, you know, our students, uh, our strategies, I should say, remain personalized. And this is something that we really pride ourselves on. We address each student's needs through the advisor-student relationship. So for example, our degree maps are tailored to each uh, specific student's needs. We have a discussion at the very start of their program and throughout their entire degree about any changes in their military professional lives, personal lives, their schedule, and we want to know when and what they need to graduate. That's really the ultimate question is, what timeline are you looking at and is it realistic to get there? And if it is, we're going to make sure that we're helping you do that. All of our outreach and most of our communication is also tailored to each student. Other than a few of our uh, automated registration reminders, advisors answer students on a case-by-case -case basis at our campus, and students never get a canned answer. All active and inactive student proactive communication is done via phone call and via email tailored to the student. And in conclusion, our advisors at the online campus really strive to create as much of an in-person experience for all of our students as we are very passionate about their success. We understand what they're going through and we care about them very much and we know that they can't get here to see us in person, so we want to try to do everything we can to assist them at every opportunity and make them feel like they have come into the office to see us. And that was just a little bit about our campus and I'll hand it back over to Jill. Thank you. Thank you, Amy and Robin. I am so pleased to find out that there are institutions like yours out there that do care so much and are so flexible with our students. 
when our military students leave the service, they come from a very structured environment. And I'm sure that your degree maps and graduation maps really help them have that security of knowing that they're taking the steps they need to in order to receive the education that is so valuable to them. Next up, we have Josh Stone. And he joins us from Southern New Hampshire University as a team lead for military academic advising. After attending our first event, Josh actually reached out to Lee Cunningham because he had more things to offer and some questions about how we could expand this. So we're so happy to have him with us today. Josh joined the Marine Corps right out of school in 1998. And he loved the Marine Corps, but he also had decided that he wanted to have a family. And so in 2004, he joined the New Hampshire National Guard in order to keep that connection with the military. So now he enjoys the best of both worlds. He gets to work with military students um, and veterans on his campus um, with a team of advisors. And on the weekends, he gets to be in the military himself. Um, their entire job at Southern New Hampshire University with the, the team that he supervises is to help those students succeed and meet their goals. They are experts at student success um, and all sorts of other military issues. And as you can see right now, Josh is joining us from a top secret location in Nevada. We are so happy that even while being deployed and being activated, he's still able to be with us. And so fingers crossed that the internet holds out. And Josh, it's all yours. Thanks, Jill. Appreciate the uh, the introduction there. It's great to be here. Uh, where I work at Southern New Hampshire University, uh, we've been consistently uh, listed as one of the top military-friendly schools. We advise students that come right out of the admissions process and until they graduate. We have a dedicated team of, right now, of over 30 advisors. They handle both undergraduate and graduate military-affiliated students. Active duty students, National Guard, reservists, veterans, and aid dependents are all assigned to a military advisor in my department. Over 95% of the advisors have either currently served, they're in the National Guard and Reserves now, or they're otherwise military affiliated. So they have that instant connection with the students because they instantly, uh, instantly understand military issues. So this is a slide uh, my military benefits department came up with to sort of take some of the mystery out of military benefits. It's a flow chart uh, that they created to help with our training process. It might be a little hard for you to see, so we've included that in the handout you have. But as you can see, after even the uh, simplification process, it can still be very confusing. So my goal today is to take some of the mystery out of the process so that you can better understand and serve your military population. Before we can talk about some of the specifics, we have to understand maybe some of the terms your students might use. They might say something like VA, which is the U.S. Department of Veterans Administration. They might say TA, which is Federal Tuition Assistance. They might use terms like the Montgomery GI Bill, which is called sometimes the old GI Bill or Chapter 30. They might say post-9-11 GI Bill. It's the most commonly used benefit you might run into. It's also called Chapter 33. Voc Rehab is vocational rehab. And a COE is a student's certificate of eligibility. So as Jill mentioned, I left active duty in the Marine Corps in 2004. Uh, I gen then joined the New Hampshire National Guard. I really had a little direction, but knew I could not get ahead without a college degree. I was fortunate enough to have the initiative to apply for the Montgomery GI Bill. I eventually transitioned that into the post-9-11 GI Bill. I'm forever grateful that my service gave me the opportunity to go to school. While also working full-time, I also attended school full-time. So without the added stressor of how to fund my education, I was able to focus 100% on school. I was able to leave school debt-free because of the GI Bill, and I don't think I'd be in the spot I am today uh, without that assistance. So the picture you see here is um, in 2005, uh, before a mission uh, in Iraq, I'm in a medevac unit. So to be able to best understand how to support your military population, you have to first determine what your population looks like. Do you have a large active duty population, a large veteran population? Uh, do you cater to spouses and dependents? By knowing your demographic, you can cater your services to support these specific students. You'll also be able to determine what training you require to competently answer questions from your students. So next, determine what your institution's current level of support is. Do you have a go-to person for military issues? What about a person uh, who works for a veterans organization on campus? Do you have a local military uh, organization you can go to with questions? So if your answer is no, uh, go ahead and take the initiative and become your institution's expert on military advising and support. This is an often underserved population that really truly under appreciates uh, your help navigating the confusing world of higher education. No matter where you work, uh, institutions large and small, they have a person who deals with military payments and certifications. 
in large institutions, you could be fortunate enough to uh, have an entire department that deals with military benefits. In small institutions, or those that a large military population, this can be one person who also has other duties. Most likely, they're going to be in the financial aid office. When you get a chance, make it a point to meet this person and use them as a resource. They're going to be able to tell you when tuition payments are received and when payments are posted from the DOD or the VA. For students, the process of knowing what they're even eligible for and how to apply for benefits can be a daunting one. Some veterans are not even aware what they're eligible for. They're potentially missing out on tens of thousands of dollars in educational benefits that they earn while in uniform. The process uh, to get these benefits is not only time consuming, but can be confusing. Even finding the link to apply for the GI Bill is not easy. To begin the process, the veteran must complete a Vaughn app, which is a veteran's online application for benefits. Once they complete this, they can go and check the status uh, of their claim on the eBenefits portal on the website. I've included uh, the links to these websites in your handout. The benefits process, uh, from beginning to receiving notification of eligibility, can be about six to eight weeks. So students need to plan ahead to be prepared for the start of their first term. A transfer benefit, say from uh, the service member to one of their dependents, uh, can take much longer as it is a two-step process. Once the VA determines veterans' eligibility, they're going to mail a COE, the Certificate of Eligibility, to them. This is the most important document when it comes to getting the veteran the benefit they earned. The COE will indicate what benefit they are eligible for, for how long, and what percentage. If you're dealing with active duty personnel, a common benefit you're going to run into is uh, tuition assistance. It's eligible for people serving on active duty, and it's funded by the Department of Defense. Each service has their own rules and regulations surrounding tuition assistance. To assist at the local level, service members have access to education officers who can assist them with the process. Their requirements are different by each branch, and each branch also has different funding criteria and how much they'll award them per year. The payback criteria can also be um, challenging because students could potentially have to repay their tuition assistance if they withdraw or fail from their classes. Tuition assistance is also a cause for concern for active duty service members. Twice in the last two years, the federal government has frozen tuition assistance for various reasons. Part of, a military, part of being a military-friendly school is having policies in place that provide support to students in these circumstances. For example, during each of the TA freezes, SNHU provided a scholarship for each active duty service member so they would be able to continue with their studies uninterrupted. Used properly, the Veterans Administration, or VA, can be an invaluable partner to enhance student success. As implied in the name, the VA deals with veterans' issues. The vast majority of the contact you're going to have with the VA is about educational benefits. So now I'm going to explain a little bit about uh, the most common benefits that they administer. Chapter 30 is what's referred to as the old GI Bill, the Montgomery GI Bill. Students receiving uh, this benefit have, have the money paid directly to them, and then they must use that money to pay the school. Chapter 31 is vocational rehab. These students have received a service-connected disability rating from the VA. They receive their tuition paid directly from the school, and also they receive a monthly living stipend. They get their books and required materials paid for as well. Every Chapter 31 student is assigned a counselor by the VA. They work closely with the student, develop a plan, and they monitor their progress. So partnering with these counselors can set your student up for success. Chapter 33 is the post-9-11 GI Bill. It's the most common benefit you're going to run into. In this case, the tuition money is paid directly to the school, and the student also receives a monthly housing stipend and a yearly book stipend. Each of these amounts is related to how long the service member served on active duty and what the enrollment status is, being full-time or part-time. Chapter 35 is the Dependents GI Bill, and it's paid similar to Chapter 30, where the money is sent directly to the student and the student has to reimburse the school. I've included a link for all this and more information about these benefits in your handout. So some keys to collaboration uh, with the VA. Veterans' benefits are really in a state of constant change due to funding priorities and VA rule changes. Keeping up with these changes is critical when you're supporting these students. Being informed not only gives you credibility, but keeps frustration levels down among your veterans. Follow-up, I cannot stress this enough. The VA deals with hundreds of thousands of students in one term. Things do slip through the cracks and technical difficulties occur, so don't let this happen to one of your students. If your student is using a certain benefit, uh, know it cold. Learn everything you can about it so you can anticipate problems before they occur. A couple tips about identifying struggling students. So as a rule, military students are going to have some sort of transitional pain point when they're coming into the academic world. Military students, both active and veteran, they'll display 
display per certain personality traits that sets them apart from their civilian counterparts. On the average, they're going to be a little older, probably more independent, and they're going to be less likely uh, to come forward for help because they're used to their classes being uh, structured and their um, classes also being pre presented in certain formats. Military classes are all very standardized and systematic. A break from these can cause stress for the student. So proper preparation and support is critical in the early terms to ensure they persist throughout their program. Getting them engaged in their classes early is also key. If they leave early in the first few terms, as you know, it's going to be highly unlikely they're going to return. Depending on the resources your institution has available for you, assessing who is struggling as a military student can present challenges. I'm fortunate enough to work in an institution that places heavy emphasis on student-based metrics and getting really granular into their courses. We're able to view an entire course for a student, um, any status that their assignment's in, um, whether a grade has uh, been assigned, if their assignment's been submitted but not graded, if nothing is submitted at all. And based on these uh, criteria, we can set up automatic outreach triggers so the advisor can contact that student personally on the phone and kind of find out what's going on with them. If you don't have such a system in place, you need to find a way to ensure um, the success of your students. Something as simple as telling a student to turn in an assignment, um, even though it seems simplistic, um, submitting work is always better than doing nothing at all. So one of the main struggles active duty National Guard and Reserve Service members has, as I'm being shown today actually, is the unpredictable nature of military life. Constant and continuous deployments, trainings, and professional development keeps them very busy. You can take the stressor away uh, by being their advocate at your institution. You must know your withdrawal and late policy to the letter. It also might be in your best interest to help your institution develop policies that help military students when these unexpected things occur. For example, at SNHU, if a student gives us a copy of their orders, we can back them out of their classes and tuition charges without any financial or educational repercussions. Of course, the ultimate goal is to keep them enrolled in classes and successful. This requires close collaboration with the professor to develop a plan to make up their work late or submit it early. So I've included in your handout a sample email that I would have an advisor send an instructor help set this up. And thank you for your time. All right. Thank you so much, Josh. That flow chart was something else. And just to think, that is the simplified version of the ways to get from point A to B. I know that your students are lucky to have yourself and others like you at your institution to help guide them through the ins and outs in order to receive their funding. I also would like to send up a little thank you to the internet for staying connected with us because the alternative would be I would have had to have done Josh part, Josh's part and I don't think I could have done it justice. Next we have Rodney Mondor and he's coming to us from the University of Southern Maine, Portland campus, thankfully the snow has allowed him to make it with to into his office with us. Rodney is the current Nakata Region 1 Chair, so if you've been to different uh, Nakata Nationalism, you might have seen him there. He is his institution's backup certifying official. He is Green Zone trained and teaches an academic self-management course to student veterans on his campus. Rodney's father retired. Um, with 20 years in the Air Force, so he grew up moving from base to base in cities and around the world. Though he did not join, he has always had a real passion for working with military students and with that population. And he feels he can relate a bit to the military veterans transition from military life to civilian life as he saw that and went through that with his own father. He considers it a privilege and an honor to serve those who have served us. And now, it's your turn, Rodney. Mike. Thank you. Thank you, Jill. Uh, <laughs> good afternoon and morning, wherever you are. Um, um, so, oops, let me get my thing set up here. The University of Southern Maine, just to kind of give you an overview of our campus, is a three campus institution with approximately 6,500 undergraduate students and 2,000 graduate students. Uh, with the average age of 27, and in a strong non-traditional presence on our campuses, bringing in our military veterans has been an enriching and educational experience for our community without a doubt. So at the start of the post 9-11 or chapter uh, 33 in 2009, the University of Southern Maine's veteran population was around 125 and since then has grown to over 425 um, participants or veterans who are utilizing uh, veteran benefits. 
Uh, this re recent increase for us has actually made the university's population for veterans the largest in the state of Maine, so we're very excited about that. In addition to our steady growth uh, in our veteran population, it has allowed us to change our school certifying official position um, from a half-time split with the registrar to a full-time coordinator of veteran services. Um, and so it's been a year and a half in the making, and we've been very excited for this growth. Recently, the University of Maine system uh, has approved to offer in-state tuition for all veterans and active duty personnel and are finalizing the process to offer the in-state tuition option for dependents who qualify under the Chapter 33 program for transferability that Josh had talked about earlier. So starting off with some of our programs, in 2009, our veteran students working with university staff did come together to secure a space which we call the Veterans Resource Center, the picture on your screen of the front door. Uh, located in our campus center on the Portland campus, this room is definitely central, centrally located so veterans can feel, have a safe space to stop in, ask questions, and hang with other students, including veterans. It is staffed by, um, by veteran students use, uh, utilizing federal and VA tuition uh, work-study monies. Uh, and the VRC is not only a place for veterans, uh, but supports our, our veterans by providing assistance around the GI Bill um, educational process. So as you saw with that diagram, it can, can be confusing for all of us. And so we have an opportunity for students to walk in and sit down with other students who have gone through the process at a computer and figure out how to apply through Vaughn app, how to get all the paperwork that they need um, with, their, with their forms so that they can get their eligibility um, started and uh, get their first um, housing allowance paycheck once the semester starts. And this is really key for them. It's all about timing. Um, also, part of that is working. The VRC also strives to work with the USM's veteran population by providing monthly newsletter, um, promoting various on and off campus uh, resources and events, and working with the coordinator. The staff also has what we have a, a robust, pretty much robust calling program. And so where all new veteran students receive a call from a current veteran as a welcoming to the university and introduction to the VRC, asking them to come on in. They invite them over for coffee, to meet at the VRC, and to learn about the space, and meet other veteran students who are taking classes. And then the calling program then continues throughout the semester, and each month, each veteran student is, receives a call updating about current events for the month, but it also um, doubles as a wellness check-in. And so we have a monthly check-in of every one of our veterans each month to ensure that our uh, veteran students are doing well or getting the services that they provide. And sometimes just having someone who's made a call will leave and go to their apartment or to their residence hall room and just connect with them and take them out. So it's a, it's a great opportunity. The VARC also um, hosts representatives from our local career center um, on, in, the, in the city of Portland. Um, the VA representatives will come in as well as voc rehab counselors We'll spend time once a month, every other week, depending on the need in the VRC as a stop, one stop for our veterans. Educational programming actually has grown over the last uh, couple of years uh, with various programs co-sponsored between our gender diversity uh, student or group organization and our multicultural center. And uh, we're, we're pretty excited about that. Recently, working with the Alumni Association, the uh, staff of the VRC was able to connect with Rear Admiral Michael J. Dumont, uh, who is an alumni and currently works at the Pentagon and has his incredible biography um, working in the U.S. Army and the U.S. Navy. Rear, Ad Rear Admiral Dumont has been on campus on a number of occasions, speaking to our students about his experience as a student at USM, some of the good and the bad, uh, and as well as his career and his military deployments. Uh, and has been very open about his transition back from these deployments to the states. And he shares these stories in hopes to help um, other students understand that they're not alone and that there are many options for them. And so he has been a great resource um, for our students as well as for the campus. Um, 
So as our, our population continues to grow, uh, there was a need to make sure that we were bringing together key members of the community so that we can uh, look at, address, discuss, uh, and educate on the various needs of our veterans. And so in 2011, we started what's called the Veteran Student Advisory Board. And sorry, I just noticed there's a typo, so it should be advisory board. Um, but or it could be an advisory board, I guess, was all set. But uh, so this was had we held monthly meetings, um, which changed to about once a semester, but have returned back to monthly meetings where student veterans, faculty, staff, uh, and representatives from, from the VA Community Resource Centers can come together. Initially, the group was designed to, to review current institutional policies and processes and then come up with some, uh, some solutions and then submit those recommendations to our, the President's Council to see if we can enact them. Um, over the course of the first year during our meetings, many of our student veterans we're sharing about experiences around and that uh, sharing experiences within the classroom and on campus in regards to transition issues that they have coming from their military life to college life. And Amy talked a little bit about that earlier. And they expressed that they were looking for some sort of common experience that would bring them together in a safe environment and allow them to talk about these, trans these transition issues. So at the time, we were very limited with resources in creating new programs and initiatives. However, we did have a course called LAC 188, which was academic self-management, which is being offered to incoming students who were admitted with various academic conditions. This course now is labeled LAC 188, which I might use to refer to it in, as in the future presentation. So there was a change. Um, but the academic self-management course was designed to address issues around study skills, time management, motivation, test taking, interpersonal skills, and reading comprehension. Uh, originally, I said designed for first year students to addressing that transition from high school to college, we felt that we could easily convert um, examples um, from this program and, address, and, and make it more personal to our student veterans. So I um, was tapped as the instructor for this class and to convert this course for a veteran-only section. So the key uh, was to help our student veteran population understand the college environment, utilize the resources available to them on and off campus, and also to help them learn how to take control of their learning environment. Uh, while at the same time learning to understand that their own decision-making processes and learning how to uh, learn to understand their decision making processes sorry um, and the factors that influence those that process uh, it was key to create an environment that was open and safe and so as the instructor I started off by sharing my background uh, with them um, and uh, everyone sharing their stories and then together we created and agreed on a code of conduct that would take place during and at, outside of class and this was really key, um, and actually one of the funny stories about that was in both classes when I, we started the expectations of the class, the first, the first example was, are we allowed to cuss? Um, and so and we would allow that, but then we had a goal that we would learn to trim down the cussing by the end of the semester, so it was, it was helpful. We did have uh, some hearty conversations um, over the semester, and I would probably make you blush if I shared some of the specifics, so I will spare you. But consistently in, with each of the classes, that the common transition themes that our students were facing um, were down below, as we listed, were going from a black and white orders type environment to the vague interpretive college experience. Um, so how to help them when things were not clear, when they're very used to being told what to do and how to do it, now having a paper that says, tell us how you feel, and they're not understanding how to do that. Uh, the second was how to work with groups when not all group members were committed to the process. Um, this is probably one of the biggest um, issues that our students had in the course, talking about coming from an environment where you really depended on everyone in your team and you knew that they would do what they needed to do and they would be there, you could always trust them. In a class situation sometimes there was always, and we've all had it, 
that one person who might not have pulled their weight. Um, and that sometimes we're getting very frustrated for our students as we talk about how to set that up ahead of time to set those expectations. The third one was managing their time outside of the classroom. Uh, and for many of our students, they would find that by going home, that equated to what they would call liberty uh, and had trouble using that time at home to do that work. And so when they were home, they were checked out, they were off duty, so to speak. And so we really spent a lot of time talking about how to control that learning environment. And if you couldn't do it at home, then let's talk about going, staying at the library for an extra hour um, or, and stuff so you can get it done so that way when you are home, then you could be at liberty. And so those were three of those common areas that we dealt with. Um, of course, we had course feedback uh, and the evaluation to assess our efforts uh, to ensure that we were definitely meeting the needs of our students. And the feedbacks definitely were positive, um, stating that participation, uh, that the participants found meaning in the course uh, and that they were able to take away those learning strategies, learning strategies within the course and apply them to other courses that they were taking. Um, and as well as applying some of those learning strategies to their life on how to work with their family when, um, at home. Um, also, without a doubt, uh, we, were, we felt we were helping our veterans transition to college life and creating mentors who then, these mentors who took the class could be part of uh, assisting others in the calling program when they're reaching out to students working at the VRC. So it, it really worked out for us. Um, of course, with all good things, there are barriers. There are some hiccups that we have. Um, so some of the challenges that came along the way were first off, uh, we discovered that we could not, we were having trouble filling a section during our fall semester. Many of our incoming uh, student veterans did not feel they needed assistance uh, going to or returning to college uh, and would not register for the class despite all of our emails, our one-to-one -one conversations that we would have with them. Um, and so that was very difficult. And a lot of them would say, we just don't ask for help. We are initially not ones who need help. We will get it done. So what happened in return, our spring section was usually filled then with our veteran, our student population who were and had academic difficulties and we were required to take LAC 188 as part of their academic recovery contract. All students have the same requirement who are on academic uh, recovery need to take the academic self-management course if they had not done so already. And so we just then required the veteran section just for the veterans. Um, part of also as the, came, the class came through um, with a lot of the changes um, with the VA benefits is that we could not make this a required course in the core or major, and it was elective an elective type course. And many of our student veterans were coming in with transfer credits, military credits, PLA, prior learning experience, and just did not have the flexibility to take additional electives and so opted not to take this course if they were able to do so. And finally, because we only could offer one section, it was trying to find that one time to meet that met the needs of a majority of our students. It was it during the day or was it at night? Uh, we did find that Wednesday night from 4.10 to 5.30 seemed to work very well um, with our students. Is it the magic bullet? We're not sure, but it seemed to work at that time. So moving on as we continue with the class, um, a lot of the feedback that we would get during class is some you know, students having some issues with faculty members not understanding how they're interpreting things uh, or with other classmates who might not understand how um, uh, one of our student veterans uh, would uh, would act or would say things, and they felt they really needed there needed to be an educational component to teach the university community more about our military veterans. And so we created um, what is called the Green Zone. And so in 2012, two of our veteran students working with our coordinator came together and uh, created started to lay out the the the, the, the the outline of what a green zone training would look like for the campus. Uh, it was uh, designed to, uh, with the input of our students, like I said, helping faculty, staff, and students become more familiar with military life and how it translates into the classroom. 
the service members, um, how and as service members transitioning into students, they face unique challenges and may have uh, need specific resources to assist them, um, assist them uh, as being successful at USM. The training sessions lasted uh, 90 minutes to two hours uh, long and consisted of a PowerPoint presentation, uh, discussion scenario of scenarios, and were facilitated uh, by student veterans and or service members at each time. Uh, during the course, participants who, uh, were, who took place at this were left with a packet of information that gave them uh, the basic knowledge on campus and community resources for veterans and handouts on key information around deployment, uh, military life, uh, and post-traumatic stress and, and uh, traumatic brain injury challenges. Uh, they, all of this information, and, and actually we also had a dictionary on common military terms that you might hear uh, a student in passing would use. Uh, once completed, um, the packet, each of our participants would also receive this green zone sticker, which you see here, very similar to our GLGBT safe zone sticker program. These stickers, now you can see them all over campus in faculty and staff offices. Um, and we're very excited of the, the number of students, faculty and staff who have participated and recently, our provost has asked that all deans, office staff, and the faculty members in those colleges participate in the Green Zone training by June 2015. So with all that going on, uh, working to educate uh, the community, uh, another group of our veteran students thought it was important that we also educate our own or educate their own veteran population on how to be a student. Uh, and so they put together what we call a reverse green zone, which we later changed the name, but it was designed to then educate the veteran student on how to be a student and how to transition, as they put it, how to transition from being a, uh, a, a student in the military to, um, or being a military student to a student in the military. So they were flipping that. Um, so we were pretty excited about that, and that moved along probably in the last uh, six months. So we sent uh, myself, the coordinator of student uh, veteran service, and myself went to a resiliency training, which was hosted at uh, MIT in December. Uh, and at that point, the students took all that information and created um, a one-day event, which will actually take place uh, this February, on February 27th, bringing USM student veterans together uh, to learn what it means to be a college student. Uh, Co-facilitated from faculty, staff, and our students, this program will also be offered as a mini session during our summer orientation program. So we're really excited to see where that's how that's going to go next week. So with all of that, we have quite a bit that's going on. Um, we could not have done it once without the support of our administration. Uh, and our faculty and our staff, but we couldn't have done what we've done so far at the University of Southern Maine if it wasn't for our students. Um, they are key to the success to all of these programs. They had the idea, they were able to, to bring them, they came forward, um, and we were able to create a positive environment for our student veterans today and for the future. Uh, and for me, I mean, it's the least I can do um, to support our student veterans, and every day is a very exciting day for me to come in and to work with our, our student population. Uh, and with that, I thank you for your time, and I'll pass it back up to Jill. All right. Thank you, Rodney. I can't wait to see about getting an official Green Zone training on my campus. And I think maybe a little digital camo razorback like this little guy would be perfect. So maybe I'll put that in our chancellor's ear. Um, at this time, we have a couple questions that um, actually are directed to Josh. So um, Joseph Murray asks, the first question is, why do you think that these um, our military students um, and our military veterans are less likely to seek help? And then the second question, also from Joseph, is um, he wants to know how the backing out of students out of their classes due to deployment um, affect their benefits. And so I'm going to let Josh go ahead and carry on with both of those. Great. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Joseph, for the question. The students, um, why are they less likely to come forward for help? I'd say it's really 
individual to the person, but there's probably some some common themes. You know, they're they're out of their safe zone in the military. When you're in the military for you know any amount of time, it kind of sort of becomes Groundhog Day, and any break from that sort of routine can can be stressful for them. So they might tend to sit towards the the back of the class and and not ask for help. They also see the you know, instructors maybe as an authority figure where in the military they're not going to question, you know, authority and they're going to be less likely to come forward or help. Um, they're also trained, you know, to get a mission and sort of do it on their own. They, they're, some of the trainings, you know, you're bulletproof, you can do anything. So it's really going to, you know, be in their mindset that they're less, you know, don't come forward for help because you could be seen maybe as, as weak or not able to do it on your own. But when really that's what we want them to do is come forward for help and use all the resources uh, that we have. The backing out of the classes, it's, it's really can be institution specific. For example, at my institution, you provide orders, you get backed out of the class. Uh, there's not even a withdrawal on your record, and there's no charges, so there'd be nothing to bill the military for. If locally, if you were to charge them for the class, um, if your policy doesn't allow for that, they can provide order their orders locally to their commanders, and they can get a waiver to get out of those specific charges for their class. Because if they fail a class or withdraw from a class. Um, it's the Army or the Navy or the Marine Corps coming after their mon uh, for the money, not normally uh, your institution because you probably already been paid by tuition assistance. So um, I encourage you to really develop a policy locally that'll that'll be friendly to the, the military folks. All right, thank you so much. Um, we also have a question here. Um, we've got a, just a couple more minutes left, but Rodney. Um, Betty Papa wants to know if y'all offer the class online. So the veteran course that you offer. Is that an online option as well? It actually, thank you. Um, that it was actually offered blended, where we submitted um, all of the text and the, the course materials on our Blackboard system so that the conversations in the class were application. How do we apply that information? We did talk about going to an online only, but we really felt the power of the conversation was important. All right, and I think we've, we're going to have time for just one more. Don't worry. If, you're, if you've typed in a question, we will get back to you individually. Um, but we do have one more, and it looks like um, Angela Ward wants Amy to talk more about how you identify struggling students from a distance. And so how do you do that in like 10 minutes or less? <laughs> the speed version. Um, yeah. I would say, you know, when identifying students from a distance, it really, again, comes from our proactive communication, like Josh and Rodney both mentioned earlier. Uh, our active duty military, and, and veteran students don't often come forward with that kind of information. We have to do a lot of questions or ask a lot of questions of our students when we're talking to them and really probe them, I think, to come forward with what kinds of things they're struggling with. Outside of that, we run a lot of reports from our student system, especially at the close of each term, to identify maybe from a, a visual standpoint with grades what students might be uh, struggling uh, at the end of the term and reach out to them that way as well. But I would say at the end of the day, it's mostly in, in regards to our proactive communication and just asking the right questions. Hope that helps. All right. Excellent. Well, thank you guys again so much. That's our time. I would like to again thank the Advising Veterans, Military Students, and Family Members Interest Group for sponsoring this webinar today. And for all of those at Nakata Executive Office who have helped to put it on, um, and for the panelists who have taken time out of their schedule to do lots and lots of practicing, I think that this went really well, and I hope that you guys enjoyed the presentation and that you got a lot out of it. Um, thank you so much for all of the participating institutions who have taken time out of your busy schedules also to be here to learn a little bit more. Um, again, we will get to all of your questions that you have, so um, be sure to be checking your email. And uh, thank you so much. Thank you.